Okay, while well, a band is uh, exiting here, we're going to approach our study in uh, Genesis today by looking first at uh, Acts chapter 17, where Paul addresses the Athenians at the Areopagus. So uh, take your Bible. Let's look at this portion because this is going to dovetail very nicely with uh, what we're exploring today. <coughs> Acts 17, beginning with verse 16, begins the context. Acts 17 to 16, it begins with these words. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshipped God, as well as in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Ep Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also debated with him. Some said, what is this ignorant show-off trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling of the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we learn something about this new teaching you are presenting? Because what you say sounds strange to us, and we would like to know uh, what these things mean. Now the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling and hearing something new. Paul stood in the middle, middle of the area up, I guess, and said, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which you, which is inscribed to, the, un, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives everyone life and breath in all things. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him as though he, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are his also his offspring. Since then, we are God's offspring. We shouldn't think that the divine, the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has pro provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him, but others said, we'd like to hear from you again about this. So Paul left their presence. However, some people joined him and believed including Dionysius, the Apagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. In my files, um, I have kept since 1990, December of 1990, I came across Life Magazine. Remember that one? <laughs> Life Magazine, December of 1990. And uh, the article was entitled, The Face of God. And in this article, it interviewed people from various backgrounds and cultures and ages and religions. And they asked each one of these people just a very straightforward question. And that is, who is God? The editor said that almost everyone we asked was remarkably eager to talk about this subject. And they, they asked a, a, a home uh, uh, a housemaid in Beirut, a street criminal in Colombia, a beggar who suffers from leprosy in India, a rabbi, a minister dying of AIDS, a church organist in the Ozarks, a second grader, 
many different people, many big different backgrounds. Uh, Rakesh Shaw, 14-year-old baseball fan in Chicago, said that he kept pictures of 25 different Hindu gods in his cabinet. And he used them like a, because he loved baseball, he used them like a, um, a baseball pitching rotation where he had one god, different god every day, although he admitted that he took out two from the rotation because they weren't doing their job. <laughs> and then came across a Hollywood producer, Linda Sparrow. She confessed this, and I'll just read her words. She says, I, I do believe in a god, but I can't make any connection to God. It's a helpless feeling that I'm all on my own. And it's been this way for 20 years. I just like to know for one day what it feels like to hand your life over to God and to say, whatever will be, I accept. To truly have peace of mind. I want my daughter to know about God because I don't want her to be in the terrible place I'm in. He, she, it, whatever gave me my daughter. God brought me Hannah and then vanished again. In this article, there are at least a couple of things that are apparent. And that is people from all over the world, all of humanity, has some sense of a supreme being. And another is that people are incurably yearning for connecting with him, to know him in some way. And that's why they were so eager to talk about this subject. Who is God? And it makes sense, because this is the way we're wired. It makes good sense to ask the question, who is God? We've been, we've been created with the capacity to ponder these things and to also yearn for some connection with God. It's one of the first questions that children ask, isn't it? Who is God and where did he come from? And so today we're going to be looking at that question because it's one of the big rock questions of life. And because we are wired with that capacity to know him, the Bible tells us that we can know him. Genesis 1.1 begins with the words, in the beginning, God. Genesis introduces us to God. Now, God is under no obligation to reveal himself. He could have remained hidden. The only thing we could have ever known about God is what we see in his works of creation. His, his eternal power, his divine nature. That, Romans 1 tells us, everybody understands, can see. It's readily there. But he, didn't, he was under no obligation to tell us anything beyond that. But he chose not to remain hidden, but to speak to us. And he did so through the word of God, the Bible. And so he came out of the shadows. And what he revealed about himself is that he is inviting us, human beings, creatures, to interact with him, to know him. It's a compelling invitation because in our hearts, that's what we want. We're wired for that, to experience God, to enjoy him, to think about him, to have a relationship with God. It's what Psalm 90 verse 1 says, Lord, you have been my dwelling place throughout all generations. Dwelling place. What a great word. To dwell with God where we find completeness, wholeness, peace of mind. We find the very thing that that lady, Linda Sparrow, the Hollywood producer, was yearning for. And she, it was just beyond her grasp. She could never find it. Why? Because she didn't know how. She didn't know the way. How do I do that? And it always eluded her. Now, last week... We determined as we looked at uh, the scripture that, that the scripture itself is um, self-authenticating. In other words, 
it proves to us that it is indeed the revelation of God. But it's not just the Holy Spirit who reveals that to us and says, yes, what you're reading is God's word. Jesus himself told us that it was, and we saw that by his resurrection, he proved that what he told us was the truth. So it isn't just circular reasoning here that the Bible is true because the Bible says it's true, but that we have God's word revealed to us in the person of Christ. And he told us that the Bible is true, and then he backed it up by raising, by rising from the dead so that we could see that his opinion, his thoughts, his statements are more important than anybody else on the planet. Jesus believed that all scripture was the word of God. Now, the Word of God declares to us that knowing God, the living and true God, is the most important knowledge that we can acquire in all of life. It tells us that not mer merely are we to have information in our brains about God, because you could take a course. You could go to college and take a course on theology proper and learn all kinds of things about God. But that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a relationship with him, knowing him like two people in a deep personal relationship with one another. Jeremiah 9.24 expresses how important this kind of knowledge is. The wise person should not boast in his wisdom. The strong person should not boast in his strength. The wealthy person should not boast in his wealth. But the one who boasts should boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, showing faithful love, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things. This is the Lord's declaration. Bang! Exclamation point. Now today I want to examine this question, who is God? And we want to do so as we look into the scripture. See, it's not good enough to say, well, you know, I'm kind of satisfied with my own idea of who God is. I mean, you've got your idea, I've got my idea. Can't we just kind of live together and, in, you know, and, and respect each other? I've got my convictions, you've got your convictions. Well, you know, I, I don't think we can do that. I, I think this is a subject that is so important, as Scripture tells us that we can't afford to get this wrong. It isn't about, well, how, you know, how do I feel about God and my own convictions? No, this is, this is exceedingly important. How important is it? John 17, 3 is, is, is uh, Jesus' prayer where he said, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. He ties eternal life into this kind of knowledge. You can't get it wrong. He states here that eternal life or the life of God in Christ is directly tied to this transforming relationship in knowing what he says, the true God, the true one, and knowing his son, Jesus Christ. To know God and to know Jesus Christ is to possess the life of God, eternal life. And so I'm, I'm stressing this because it's common today for people to say, well, I'm, I'm into choosing for my own, you know, and, and, uh, and I think everybody is free to choose how they want to believe what's true for us. And for you guys to limit it, to say there's only one way, is very arrogant. In fact, it's an insult to all of the others in this world who have different beliefs. And you're going to tell them that you've got to believe my way? And that's where we find ourselves in, in our age. You might even hear someone say to you, well, that's your interpretation of the Bible. Or they may say, well, what you believe is true for you, but it's not for me. So we have to answer this question, who is God? 
and recognizing that there are going to be many different kinds of opinions out there in the world in which we live. And everybody thinks, well, not everybody, but many of them say, well, you know, they're all to be acceptable. We're all to kind of respect each other in this. When we were reading through Acts 17, Paul was in Athens and he was talking to people just like that. It's like America, only it's ancient Athens. It, it would be like him walking into Times Square and talking to the, you know, Joe American or whoever on the street and to find that it sounds the same. People just haven't changed, have they? And so we come to Acts 17 and we see that kind of pushback that he gets when he starts to preach in this open air marketplace. Acts 17, 18 says some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated him. Some said, who is this ignorant show off? What's he trying to say? And others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities. To the, to the citizens of Athens, it sounded like Paul had st stepped off of another planet because they had no categories to understand what he was talking about. Their worldview was so diametrically opposite to what his was that it, 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 they didn't, couldn't even understand him as to what he was talking about. And so they said, they mocked and said, well, what's this babbler trying to say? Now, it's not the first time that Paul had been mocked, but who of us likes to be called an airhead? And yet that's what they were doing. I think it would be instructive for us to, to look at how Paul talked to these philosophers about the truth of God. Now, he did not approach those on, on what is called Mars Hill or the Areopagus. He did not approach them the same way that he would have talked to those in the synagogues because they were different worldviews. The, the, the Athenians that he was talking to at the Areopagus, they had, no, they had never read the scripture. So, so it was completely foreign to them. Whereas if you were a Jew or you were a God-fearing person, at least you could start from some common ground. But these people had no idea what he was talking about. Paul had to start at the beginning. He had to start in Genesis. In the beginning, God. He starts there because he had to build for them a whole new framework so that they could understand the gospel. I think this is very instructive for us because we've been raised, some of us, that you're going to just start in John 3.16. God so loved the world. And you're, you're talking to somebody, and, and their notion of God, he goes by a different name. So it's not good enough for you. Well, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. They think, what are you talking about? They have no idea. Where should we start? John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, this sounds a lot like Genesis. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word created everything. Nothing that has been created was apart from Him. So you start there. You start at the beginning. And that's where we need to do. You, you don't start. You know, it's like walking into the middle of a movie. You don't have any idea what came before. So in the, our day and age, we have to start at the beginning and not assume that the God you're talking about is the same God. That God that they, they worship, what if it was that fellow with 24 of them in his cabinet on a pitching rotation? He's going to be thinking out of different kind of a, of a God. So let, let's use Paul's example here and assume that we live in Athens. Everywhere we go, work, school, wherever. Now let's listen to how he answers this question, who is God? 
Keep in mind that Athens was the intellectual capital of the world. Rome may have been the military capital, but Athens prided itself in being like the Harvard University of the entire kingdom. And there were a lot of smart people there, at least intellectuals, who, who lived there. And they spent a lot of time, we're told that they just spent all of their time talking about new ideas and new philosophies. So we come to verse 19, and it says, uh, that they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we learn about this new teaching that you're presenting? They invited him up there. Say, we'd like to be, have you be a guest speaker. Could you make it? He said, what time do you want me there? I'll be there. You know, last week I mentioned the TV show, The View, the daytime show, and the panel that's represented there. And I made a point of saying that what they say represents their worldview. Imagine if the Apostle Paul was invited as a guest on The View. And that he, what would he share? What would he say if they gave him the floor? And if he's talking to, you know, Whoopi Goldberg and Joy Bear and Sonny Hostin, the whole company, what would he say to these ladies? He would say what we find here. He would start with these principles, which is a biblical worldview. Verse 24, go to it. Notice what it says. I'll read it again. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by hands. The first thing that he says here is this, that God... The true God is the creator of the world and everything in it. That's where we start. That nothing exists that God did not create. And the Bible informs us that it was Jesus Christ that was the agent through whom the world and the universe and everything was created. The Father planned it. Jesus executed it. He created, that's what Colossians 1.16, for everything was created by him, him meaning God the Son. Now, when we come to Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God, the name of God there is Elohim. Now, this is probably the most common name of God used in the Old Testament. And it's a name that expresses God's unlimited power, which, of course, makes sense given the creation story, the account, that he's transcendent, that he's the majestic one, the supreme one. Isaiah 45, 18 says this, for, for this is what the Lord says, the creator of the heavens and the God who formed the earth and made it, the one who established it. He did not create it to be a wasteland, but formed it to be inhabited. He says, I am the Lord and there is no other. Wow, that's a great verse. 4518 of Isaiah. Boy, put a circle around that one. That's a good one. The Apostle Paul, now he's very respectful of his audience and recognizes that as he was walking through their city, that he could observe that they worship many different kinds of gods and they had monuments and shrines and uh, temples devoted to these different names of the gods that they worship. But he was never timid. He was respectful. He was courteous. But he was never timid about telling them the truth. So that when we read what we read in verse 24 there, it's as though he's saying that there is only one God, people. I know that you've got lots of them that you recognize in this city, but there is only one God, and he created everything that exists. He is the sovereign one, the supreme Lord of heaven and earth. He owns it, and he rules over it. It's his. Now, Paul, by that very statement, rules out pantheism, which is very common, and still is, of course, today in, in uh, many of the Eastern uh, religions and philosophies, 
so that to, in, as those to say that creation itself is God. But no, Paul makes it very clear. The wording is really important here because he separates God from his creation. God is distinctly separated, and yet he is Lord over all of it. And there's no part, there is no part of creation that God cannot point to and say, I own that, and I rule over that. It's all his. That comes with being the creator. That's the rights of being the one who created it all. Now, it, this is important because people today, they don't want to be told that there is only one God. He owns you, and he is the supreme God that you are required to worship. Imagine if Paul had said that on The View. How do you think that would go over with the whole group? The whole group. To, to say, you know... That he, you know, people today, they will say, well, I'm the master over my life. That's my right. I have the right to choose what I want to do. And it comes as a real shock for people to be told, you are not the God over your life. And the God who created you, who gave you life, is the one who owns you and has a claim upon you. And you answer to him. He's the sovereign Lord. And so it, it, Paul immediately puts us in a posture of humble submission because we recognize our creator. So that's the framework. That's where he starts. But that's only one piece of the framework. There's some others. The second one would be found in verse 25. Neither is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath in all things. The second plank of this framework would be this, that God, the true God, doesn't need us. We need him. And, and so the very breath that we have, Paul is saying, is a gift. It's granted to us by the one who sustains the universe. God doesn't keep us around as though somehow he needs us. Do you think he's, he needs us? He doesn't. It's not like, well, I'm looking for company. Or I want people to, you know, these creatures, I want them to make me feel important. So I'm going to have them worship me. And it isn't though we're around because he feels more fulfilled that's absurd. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're very content in that relationship. And have been from eternity past. God always was. And so for, him, for us to be able to, 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 to think that somehow that God takes orders from us, I don't think so. We take orders from him. God doesn't need us. We need him. Verse 25. But he goes on, the third plank of this framework would be found in verses 26 through 29. As he says, uh, from one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries where they live. He did this so that they might seek God, and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and find our being. As even some of your own poets have said, we, uh, for we are also his offspring. Verse 29, since then we are God's offspring, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and, or an imagination. So the third plank of this could be this, that God, the true God, the true God is in charge of all nations. He's in charge of all rulers. He's in charge of the limits, and he's in charge of history. All humans are related to our original parents, 
And so it, it, it's, um, it's, it's inappropriate for one people group to think of themselves as superior and to think of others as inferior. That's, again, nonsense. Every nation, people, tribe, and language group is on level ground before God because they were all created by him. The sin of bigotry and the sin of racial injustice and even the sin of, of, of inappropriate nationalism is due to the sin of the fall. And, and because we were alienated from God, we became divided from one another. No wonder we are in the mess that we are today. It's because of the fall, it's because of sin and, and the corruption of our thinking. So therefore we're broken. And because we're broken as human beings, we, we need to look to God for to how to fix it. He's the only one who can fix it. But not, not only are we related to one another, but also uh, he sets the boundaries. He sets the limits. And we're accountable to him, as is going to come up in the next plank. The fourth plank in this is verses 30 and 31. Where he is, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed, and he has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. The third or the fourth plank, the final plank in this, is, is that God, the true God, is going to judge the world. Notice that he's not trying to so contextualize this, to so, you know, make this, I'm not, he, he's just not trying to accommodate his audience, to water it down. This is not gospel, you know, light version here. He, and, and keep in mind there, we've only, how many minutes did it take me to even read this? Hardly any, right? So, how, how long do you think he must have talked? Maybe for hours. We're just getting the sketch of this. This is like, you know, cliff notes. Remember those? You didn't use those, did you? I know I didn't. What? Yeah, cliff notes. But that's kind of what we have here. We have just the outline of what he said. But so he zeroed in on the gospel right here and began to, he wasn't going to lighten up at all to make it more pleasing to his audience. And I'm sure he understood that when he got to this point, he turned the corner, he knew this was going to set a bitter taste in their mouth as they listened to him, especially when he mentioned the resurrection, because he must have already gotten some pushback on that when he was in the marketplace and he was in his debates, as, as uh, Luke says, took place there. So he probably knew, I know what's coming. And so he mentions the resurrection, and especially that God has appointed the judge. You know, when we come to this point in our, in our own conversations with people, it's exceedingly important for us to not back away from the full presentation of the gospel because we believe that it's going to, to go down sideways. We can't do that because this is the truth. Paul did it, and we've got to be just as clear as he was. And so he gives the exclusive claims here. Let's not be clear in our throat. You know, let's not be embarrassed about this. Let's not be digging our toe into the dirt, you know, as though somehow, well, you know, I got to say this. No, this is not going to be welcome, but here I go. No, no, look at him eyeball to eyeball and just say it because it's very clear that he doesn't, he doesn't back away from this. Now, what is also suggested here is that his sermon was cut short, that when he got to this point, he wasn't able to finish. He would have said much, much more about this. But he got this um, reaction. There were some whose consciences were being stirred by the Holy Spirit to believe, but there were a whole lot of others who began to laugh at him, and they must have rolled their eyes when he started talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember this. This is what Jesus said, what I mentioned earlier. This is eternal life, 
that they may know you, the only true God. We got to have that. The only true God. Not just, well, you know, this is the God I've come up with. No, no. You're not a Christian unless it's the God of the Bible. And then beyond that, the only true God and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. Knowing God, the true God, through Jesus Christ. So we have to move beyond just that intellectual agreement. I mean, you could take a course, as I said in college, on religion and come to Christianity and have all of the facts down, but never believe. Just because you have it in your mind, that doesn't mean that it has stirred your soul to believe. And when I say believe, I'm talking about embracing, relying upon Christ and understanding that, that it's only through Jesus Christ that we have the forgiveness of sin and a right relationship with God. True Christianity starts with saving faith. It always has. So let me sort of just um, uh, recap where we are and, and then add to it. Genesis 1.1 invites us to get to know God, to start there. And it invites us into a relationship with him because that was the original design of creation. You were created to be happiest and most satisfied and most complete in knowing God in a right relationship with him. Psalm 91.1 says, The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. To dwell there. Remember that statement from Linda Sparrow, the Hollywood producer? Did you hear the cry of her heart? I mean, that poor woman. She said, I want to make a connection with God, but I can't do it. I've been like this for 20 years. What do I do? And I hope my daughter comes to know him and doesn't have to be in the terrible place where I'm at. She wasn't dwelling with the Most High. We get an opportunity to do that, to dwell with him. Jesus said, see, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. That's what it looks like. Is God your home? Is that where you dwell? Are you experiencing a close friendship with God through Christ? It tells us in, in uh, Genesis, we'll look at it later you know, in some weeks, that Enoch walked with God. That's what we're talking about. Dwelling with God, eating with Jesus and he with us. Enoch walked with God. He had a, a knowledge of God, like a friend with a friend. Not just knowing about God or knowing of God, but he knew God. And so I would implore you, if, if you're away from God, would you come back home? You need to come home. You need to come to a place where you're dwelling with God, the Most High God. And there you are going to find your joy. You will find quietness of heart and rest for your soul. Because I can't believe that since you've been away from home, that you're really happy. You need to come back home. You need to come back to God and discover that. And to say, Lord, would you teach me to dwell in your presence first? And not try to find what I'm looking for in this empty frenzy in the world. I'm going to find it only in you. Boy, you know, if Linda Sparrow the producer, had known about this. It would have changed her life. But it was always just beyond her grasp. I want to connect with God, but I don't know the way. Well, what is the way? He told us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. It's knowing God through Jesus Christ, that gives us completeness. And then we dwell in the shadow of the Almighty. Let's pray. Our God, as we do approach you today, 
we do so humbly, acknowledging that you are the one who has created us and created life, and that you have offered it to us through Jesus Christ to enjoy eternal life, life with you. And so we pray that you would instruct our hearts as we come to not just know about you or know of you, but to really know you. Show us who you are in the pages of Scripture. Help us to digest it and to plug it into our lives, to live by it, to honor you in our walk, in our speech, how we conduct ourselves in the community or at the university, where, wherever it may be, that we would honor you. Help us to that end, we pray. Our great God and Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, amen.